it's just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Dr. Hannah C. Hobbs, DDS, MS, a diplomat in the American Board of Periodontology with over 25 years of dental and periodontal experience. She earned her undergraduate degree from the University of Maryland in College Park and went on to receive her DDS from the University of Maryland Dental School, graduating magna cum laude. Dr. Hobbs completed her general practice residency at York Hospital in York, Pennsylvania, and was the chief resident the following year at Carolina's Medical Center in Charlotte, North Carolina. Dr. Hobbs worked as a general dentist in Charlotte for a year before deciding to specialize in periodontics. She attended the University of California, San Francisco, where she earned her certificate in periodontology while simultaneously earning a master's degree in oral biology with emphasis on the link between periodontal disease and diabetes and TGFB. Uh, TGFB's Transforming Growth Factor Beta. I had to look that one up. She received the most innovative clinical research award in her senior year at UCSFS from the Western Society of Periodontology. She then moved to Durham, North Carolina, where she established a private practice in periodontology and implantology. She operated a highly successful private clinic in Durham and received her diplomat of the American Board of Periodontology in 2000. She has been an assistant professor at UNC School of Dentistry, postgraduate periodontology department since 97, and she rose to the ranks of the North Carolina Society of Periodontists, serving as president in 2014. In 2015, she started the Hobbs Spear Study Club. She enjoys the opportunity to interact with great restorative dentists and specialists and has been a member of numerous study clubs in the Triangle area, including Wake County Dental Society and Seattle Study Club. In 2018, she sold her practice and joined New Image Surgical Center. She has presented to numerous organizations over the years, including Wake County Dental, um, all around North Carolina, Durham Health Department, Duke Endocrinology, Grand Rounds, and numerous local study clubs. She was born in Egypt, raised in Germany. At the age of nine, she came to the U.S. with her family. She's married to Jim Hobbs, a Greensboro native, and they are proud parents of their daughter, Madison. In her free time, she enjoys spending quality time with her family, exercising, and watching her daughter do gymnastics. She's a proud supporter of hospice, the Food Bank of North Carolina, the Pulmonary Fibrosis Society, the American Cancer Society, Durham Rescue Mission, Doctors Without Borders, and the Salvation Army. She also volunteers for the Baptist Mission Dental Bus, Wake Smile Dental Clinic, and Murham Dental Clinic. My gosh, you've lived in Egypt, Germany, San Francisco, and North Carolina. Uh, which one uh, was the best? Uh, North Carolina. North Carolina? What I yeah. What I love about North Carolina is you got all four seasons, but no extremes, yeah. just mild four seasons. Well, we have a lot of humidity. I love San Francisco. I love grad school, but it's just, I'm not a big city person. So it's tough to live in San Francisco if you're not a big city person. Huh. And um, so or now do you remember Egypt or Germany or were you just a little baby? Yes. Uh, I I loved Germany. I was uh you know real. I was young when we lived there. The food I remember the food was fabulous. Like the food was unbelievable, and no one gained weight. You ate all the time, and we always had uh, hazelnut ice cream after dinner. So that was my memory of, of Germany. It was awesome. Food was unbelievable. And next and, and this I month field hockey. And this month is the IDF meeting. That's the largest dental meeting of the in the world. Is every other year in Cologne, really? Germany. Uh, wow. uh, America is very fragmented because every state has their annual meetings and you got a bunch of big meetings like you just had Chicago and Yankee and all yeah. these things. But Europe pretty much just has one monster meeting every other year and, and over 100,000 dentists go there from every single country on earth. Wow. And, uh, and I love it because Cologne, actually the Roman Empire's furthest outreach east was Cologne, Germany. So it's got a mix. So you can get all your German food, you can get all your Italian food, and then you can get that hybrid Italian German stuff in the middle. It's just, it's just amazing. And uh, but you know, I, I've always said on this show, I've been a dentist for thirty-one years. Of all the nine specialties recognized by the ADA, yours has probably changed the most. I mean, I, there hasn't been these monumental changes in endo and pedo and all these things like that. I mean, when I got out of school, it was all 
four quads of root plane curatage and four quads of surgery. And then about 10 years after school, a lot of people decided the best way to treat perio was just to extract it and place implants. And then after 10 years of that, they're seeing all this peri-implantitis. And now I see it going back to old school, traditional stuff where people are, are, are you know, I'm seeing treatment plans. It's like, my gosh, is it 1987 all over again? So where are we at? Are you treating perio with forceps and titanium? Are you going back to old school, traditional periodontal surgery? Well, I'll be honest with you. I, I am trying more in the business of saving teeth um, because as you said, you know, 20 to 30% of implants will wind up failing. They're either ailing or failing, but I do not do traditional periodontal surgery as much. I've been laser certified now for eight, eight or nine years. So I do the LANAP surgery and I've been doing it for many years and it's literally revolutionized my practice. Well, do you know a periodontist in my backyard, Arizona, uh, Alan Honigman? Alan yes. He's a um, he, yes. I, ha I have to give him so much credit because he was the first adopter of LANAP and people were yeah. openly saying it was no good and he's crazy and all this stuff like that. Right. And yeah. then 10 years later, every periodontist I know is like waiting in the deal. So I always tell Alan, I said, my gosh, uh, pioneers get the most arrows in their back. When he started it, yeah. no one believed it. And now it's going mainstream. But I have to tell you, um, it, it's a chunk of change. It's 135,000 yeah. bucks. Is it, is, it a re, is it worth it? Is it a return on investment? It as a specialist, as a periodontist, I don't know as a general dentist, but as a specialist, for me, it paid for itself in the first year that I had it. Um, it was a little less than what it is now, but um, within the first year of having it, and I really cannot see a periodontist practicing without having that in their armamentarium because patients are savvy. They, they will look stuff up and um, this is a, a non-invasive way to treat periodontal disease and um, it really works. I've seen incredibly uh, ridiculous cases that ha that I've been able to salvage teeth that I don't think a bone graft uh, in, to do an implant would have worked. And I think I sent you um, a couple of slides of that. Um, yeah. Um. For the for the kids who don't know what LANAP is, explain what LANAP is. So it's called laser assisted new attachment procedure. So uh, there are several lasers in dentistry. Um, this specific laser uh, is uh, NDAG, so the wavelength is 1064. There's an erbium laser, there's a CO2 laser, there is a diode laser. So the diode laser wavelength is like 830 to 1064. The NDAG is 1064. Erbium is like 2000 to 3000. The CO2 is a little less. So the NDA, the beauty about that is that it selectively removes the diseased tissue. So you're not removing healthy tissue. That is one of the biggest downfalls with periodontal surgery is that you're cutting gum away and you're counting on your naked eye to discern the healthy versus unhealthy gum. And then what winds up happening as a result, you'll have a lot of recession and the teeth are sensitive, the teeth are longer, the patients are in a lot of pain and or discomfort. And it just sounds horrible. You're cutting the gum open, you're uh, cleaning the roots, which you do with the uh, linen app, but you're, there's no sewing, there's no stitches. And so the, on a scale of one to 10, most people come back. I saw somebody today that I did a laser on a week ago. He said he took one Tylenol. You know, pain is very subjective, but he took one Tylenol, that's all. Um, and the biggest limitation with the laser is that you cannot chew on the side that was treated this, you know, for about a week to 10 days. But for the most part, I've seen really uh, great results. And over the years, uh, as I've used the laser, I've learned variations of things that I could use it for. I've expanded my use of the laser. And also I have fine tuned, you know, I've learned from my mistakes, what I've done right and wrong. Well, when someone tells you they only took a Tylenol, you got to make sure they're not Irish because it might have been an Irish guy and he had one <laughs> Tylenol and three quarts of Jameson whiskey. So you got to you got to you got to qualify that. Um, yeah, the lasers. Um, it's it's um it, it's amazing. These these kids come out of school and they're doing hygiene checks, and it's very stressful for them because 
they see all this periimplantitis around a late around an implant uh but you know yeah. it's like high blood pressure the patient doesn't feel it they can eat anything they want it, it's hard to um communicate to someone that something's wrong when they don't have any pain um what what is your uh how do you successfully do that? How do you tell grandpa who doesn't have any problems and he didn't have a problem until you started telling him he had periimplantitis. Um, how, how, how do you sell that to someone with no pain? So how about if, can I just go back to just teeth for in general? Because perio, we spend, most periodontists spend a lot of time with the patient. We spend a lot of time educating the patient. It is a silent disease. They're there because I saw somebody today, why are you here? My dentist told me to come. I'm not having any problems. So you measure and they've got eight, nine, 10 millimeter pockets, they've got bleeding. You can, uh, you have to just sit down and explain to them that periodontal disease is like high blood pressure. It's only bad when you have a stroke, but in the meantime, it could be high. And it's the same thing we, uh, I use a lot of audio visual aids to review probing depth, bleeding. These are all inflammatory markers that should not be there. As far as implants, the beauty is you can take an x-ray and show them when they started off what the, what the implant looked like and where we are today. You can just show them the bone loss and explain that to them. Well, and they're like, well, it doesn't hurt, it doesn't bother me. <laughs> and then you have to step in and say, well, if you don't treat it, it's gonna take the adjacent teeth down with it. You're gonna lose bone on the adjacent teeth. Now you have a three tooth problem or three site problem, not just the single implant. Um, but yes, periodontal disease, you know, at, when I first got out of school, it was, uh, this is your problem, you need to do it. Not many people were signing up for surgery or treatment. It's because, you know, our skill set in dental school, unfortunately, is not to communicate clearly. And I was talking about primary occlusal trauma, secondary occlusal trauma, and you could just see the patient's eyes roll in their head. You just have to keep it simple and you explain to them that, there's so many links between periodontal disease and heart disease, pancreatic cancer, uh, lung disease, lung cancer, Alzheimer's. All Everyone knows now that most of the systemic disease, they're finding an uh, uh, infective link, so, like for example, Alzheimer's. So if you tell the patient, um, you, if you wanna prevent that, maybe you wanna take care of periodontal disease. And for me, as a, I got my master's degree with a link in diabetes, so what I tell the patient is periodontal disease is considered the six complications of diabetes. So imagine, you, and this is what I exactly say, imagine you have 10 toes that are infected and you're walking around, you're just changing your shoe every day. What kind of um, burden would that be on your system? It would be an incredible amount. Your body's gonna be trying to fight off 10 infected toes and while at the same time trying to manage your blood sugar. And it's not gonna win the blood sugar. They're gonna try to wall off the infection. It's gonna go gangrene, you're gonna lose the toes. It's the same thing with your teeth. You've gotta remove the infection in order to systemically heal. And lots of studies have shown if you control periodontal disease, you can improve the glycosylated end products, you can reduce the blood sugar. There have been many, many, many studies. I mean, I remember one grad, specifically from grad school, Pima Indians in Arizona, where you're from, they have a very high incident of type two diabetes. And so periodontal disease runs very uh, rampant in them. And they were able to show when they control the periodontal disease, they were able to improve the, peri uh, the diabetic markers and vice versa. When they improve the diabetes, they're able to improve the periodontal disease. So it's a hand in glove sort of thing. And that is exactly what I tell the patients. I usually cite that study. Yeah, and and then and the biggest one, the most expensive one, is premature babies. Um, yes, I mean a preemie is a million dollars, and you're starting to see yeah. these insurance companies when they see these um, um, pregnant mothers and their medical doesn't cover dental, they're starting to rethink why is the mouth not covered? Because if gingivitis <clears throat> or gum disease, well, do you think gingivitis or gum disease? causes premature low weight babies? So, I mean, I do agree. And uh, Steve Offenbach, a rest of soul, had an incredibly beautiful model where he had hamsters and he induced periodontal disease in them. And they had premature pups, the p hamsters that had uh, uh, periodontal disease. So he had a very eloquent uh, animal model for that. We obviously can't duplicate that in humans, but 
in my experience, I've seen that to be true. Um, I've also seen that to be, you know, a lot of our patients are middle-aged patients that come to the periodontist and they have uncontrolled periodontal disease and then, then they disappear for a few years because they have, they had a heart attack or they had a stent place. And you come back and say, well, you know, there's a huge link between periodontal disease and cor coronary vascular disease. You know, let's get this under control so you don't have another MI because the cytokines and the endotoxins from the periodontal pathogens create a clot just like you would, um, you know, a cholesterol clot in the arteries. And that's been proven and shown. Um, when, when you're um, looking at periodontal disease and um, implantology, back in the day when the implants come out, they started going with HA coatings. And then and that's kind of um, uh, no longer the deal. Do you think some implants are more resistant to um, periimplantitis than others? You know, I may get shot by like 50 in, implant companies here, but I don't think so. Uh, I had a patient today who um, had rampant periodontal disease, the one that had no idea why she was there. But before she left, she said, can I have two implants on the lower right? She's missing 30 and 31. I said, ma'am, no, you have to control the periodontal disease. You wouldn't put a roof on a house that's on fire. You need to put the fire out, fix the damage, and then you could put a new roof on. So I don't really think any implant per se is resistant. Per you can get periodontal disease around implants. As a matter of fact, with the LANAP, um, I try to get my patients not to be so insurance driven and do you know, one side one year, another side the next year, because one side will reinfect the other. Um, and also you can transmit it to your spouses, to your kids. Um, I, I can't believe so, I can't believe how many dentists on Dental Town don't even believe that. I mean, like I'll give you an example. Let's go to pediatric dentistry. Whenever I see a two-year-old that needs to be taken to an OR and that needs eight pulpotomies and eight chromosome crowns, well, everybody living in that herd in that house has got rampant decay. The mom, the dad, the babysitter. I mean, yeah. you you just can't have a two-year-old kid need eight pulpotomies and chrome cell crowns. Everybody sharing utensils and kissing that kid has got bombed out teeth. Well, doesn't it have to be the same for periodontal disease? It absolutely does. You, They actually, uh, I forgot what study it is, they actually showed that you can share the same microorganisms with your dog if you're kissing your dog. Yeah, I'm gonna have to give my two dogs away. Uh, this could be a problem. <laughs> Uh, I, uh, uh, Sammy and uh, Rufus are going to have to uh, find a new dad. Um, but yeah, but it, it's, I mean, you, you go to other sciences, they talk about herd diseases. I mean, a herd has their diseases. And, and when again, yeah. when, it, when you see a two-year-old that has a bombed out mouth, and, and it's a great practice builder because, you know, the women are so maternal instinct as soon as they get pregnant. I mean, it's all about the baby. And I sit there and have a long education talk with them. And I said, I, I can't have anybody kissing this baby with a bombed out molar and periamplantitis around a half erupted wisdom tooth. And then your grandma's gonna come over and she's got an upper denture and a lower partial and nine millimeter ble bleeding pockets. And 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 you think um, she's gonna babysit your child. I need the, I tell them I need the whole herd in here. And then when you flip over to perio, how many times have you seen a patient that's come in every three months for 10 years and they and the office has never seen her husband? And it's like, yeah. so she's kissing and her husband and you, you've never even seen him. I mean, do, don't you think that in 2019 we have to treat the herd? Yes, that's an excellent point. You make an excellent point and that's a great practice builder to say, you know what, I'm, I'm concerned about your spouse or your kid or your your partner, please bring them in so at least we can do an examination and make sure that um, that we're treating them as well. That's You make an excellent point. That's a great practice build. And, and, and it's it's almost like the mouth is a different part of the body that doesn't, that's not, can, you know, connected to the rest of the body. You know, you have medical insurance and dental, but dentists believe a lot of things the rest of the medical doesn't. Like, like if, I, I wouldn't treat you for an STD every three months for 10 years without saying, hey, 
I'd like to see your boyfriend. Can we get him in here? I, I mean, it's just, you know, why would it be different below the waist, above the waist? And and when you and when you tell grandma, you know, I think it's because your husband has gum disease and decay, or I, I don't think it would, you know, be a problem. And they they immediately get him. No no woman's gonna get their teeth cleaned every three months at a periodontist and, and then and then go home and kiss her husband that hasn't been in, in ten years unless she's educated um on the um event. Um I wanna go through um so so what's um you know, they're, they're, they're young, they're out of school, you know, they, they come out of school, they've only done like 50 fillings, 10 canals of endo, maybe three dentures or partials. So I just wanna go through some various subjects and just try to educate. Remember, a quarter of our listeners are still in dental kindergarten, they haven't even graduated yet, and the rest yeah. are all under 30. Um, talk about mucogingival defects. Okay, great. So um, the uh, there's the old classification systems uh, Miller 1, 2, 3, and then there's the new classification system from the American Academy of Perio and the European Academy of Perio, RT 1, 2, and 3. So mucogingival defect. The best thing, the way I explain it to people and the patients and the doctors that I've worked with is the narrower and shallower the defect, the greater the opportunity to get 100% of the root cover. So if you wait till you have a cleft that on let's say a lower incisor that's five, six, seven millimeters deep, the chance of you getting 100% of the root cover goes down. But if the recession is like three or two or, or four, even four, uh, the opportunity to get 100% of the root is covered. And how I explain it to the patient is the gum recedes, the bone recedes with it. And over time, what happens is either the tooth will drift facially or drift up. So what we're doing a graft for, and I do, um, I have not done a free gingival graft in probably nine years. Uh, I've done only connective tissue graft, and I don't use the alloderm or a donor site. I, I use the patient's tissue. Um, that if we use a, do a connective tissue graft, we can reestablish the thick band of keratinized gum, and I have a sleeve, like I'll use my sleeve on my gown, and it forms a collar around your tooth, and it protects it. So a lot of dentists will come out there, you know, uh, want to put a composite on, on the abfraction lesion. I would say hold off. Don't put the composite on until the recession is treated, and then you'll see if you even need to uh, go back and put a composite. Because a lot of times, and I'll speak from my experience, I will go in during the surgery, smooth the abfraction lesion down so that it's flat. I use a round diamond or a football diamond and then lay my graft across it. And a lot of times you get connective tissue reattachment and you can cover that abfraction lesion. It, it, obviously, if it's in enamel, you can't, but if it's in dentin, you can. You know, it's funny, when I was in dental school, um, all those abfractions were told and taught to me that it was from brushing back and forth in a sawing motion. And then it wasn't even five years out of school, the veterinarians were saying, well, that's funny, we see them and sheep and hogs and horses and cattle and we're pretty sure they don't brush their teeth so what does cause an abfraction so i'll tell you you know i've been out of school for a while the longer i'm out of school the more and more i see how occlusion pays an incredible portion uh in dentistry to me a lot of these abfraction lesions that you see will be an occlusal trauma issue uh, I saw an abfraction lesion on the lingual of an upper molar. There's no way you can brush that surface off. That tells me that tooth is in traumatic occlusion, and it's usually the centric stop or the centric interference when the patient closes. And so that needs to be equilibrated so that there's not that. If you do a graft on something that is in traumatic occlusion, it's going to recede again. So one of the very first things actually that I do is uh, check occlusion, even for a soft tissue graft. Check in, in centrics, excursive, especially protrusive for the lower incisor. Because you, you, it's amazing how many people uh, will ride on their lower incisors forward. And then sometimes you'll get uh, attrition with compensatory super eruption. Do you think it's fair to say that dentists treat three diseases, caries, perio, and occlusal? Yes, I do. Occlusion is so important. I mean, it is so vital to everything we do. Talk about periimplantitis. Uh, a significant amount of that is occlusal trauma. 
Um, and if that is not addressed or discussed with the patient before, I almost always ask my restorative doctors to um, make a bite guard for the patient afterwards. Even if the patient refuses, at least you've had this conversation with them. And I also say, you know, keep the occlusion light, use uh, custom abutments that are custom to the implant. That's, that's another very important point. Um, and I think a lot of the younger doctors, oh, I'm going to save, you know, a few dollars here. Let's say you're, you're doing a Straumann. You need to use Straumann components because if the implant fails, they're not going to cover the abutment and the crown if you didn't use component parts, if you used some knockoff. It, it's not going to be covered. And so now you're going to be going back to your patients saying, you got to pay another lab and abutment fee. And most patients are gonna, aren't going to be happy with that. You know, but one of my recommendations, sorry. Go no, ahead. go ahead. Go ahead. I mean, one of my recommendations today, I saw one of my implants. I followed up. I said, please uh, use component parts that are specific to the implant and keep the occlusion light and make a hard mouth guard for the patient. At least somebody needs to have that discussion with the patient so that they are aware that there is trauma from occlusion on the implants and there's no proprioceptive ligaments. So they cannot feel when they're biting very, very hard on the implant and you can cause trauma from occlusion. You know, the late um, Carl Misch, who was on uh, episode uh, 282, um, he actually got his start in removable prosthodontics and he was making dentures and people were having uh, implants was just getting going and these people were all complaining that the implants were cheap because they were snapping at the bone at the gum line and he was looking at me said my god you the the bite is off so horribly uh, that that that's so that's why and so it's amazing the cross training he by learning how to build removable dentures um, that was the cross training he needed to know how to properly plane a, an implant. And I bet you most people, when they look at periimplantitis, are just their mind says, "Well, I know it doesn't have a cavity; it's titanium, so it's all perio." And and they and that might be the blind spot that it might be all occlusal. Yes, you know, um, I was a, like you said, I was a general dentist first, so I, you know, to me it, that was really key, and I. I wish all specialists could be general dentists first because it really gives us a great appreciation. It's kind of hard to jump out of dental school and go into a, a specialty training. I feel like we all need to have that one or two years where you're a general dentist, you're doing everything. So you see when things come in, like why something didn't work. It's not necessarily the doctor's fault or the patient's fault. It's just that circumstances. And be, having been a general dentist has made me um, – like a really, you know, I feel I feel for the general dentist, especially when you see something and you know the patient it hasn't list. Like the lady I saw today, she's more worried uh, about the lack of 30 and 31, whereas her front teeth are splaying because she has no posterior occlusion to bite on. And I said, well, the reason your front teeth are splaying because you have no posterior teeth. Well, can I just have the implants forget about my front teeth moving? And I said, no, they all co go hand in hand. Um, I mean, I'm getting on my soapbox, but I, I do feel like as specialists, we all need to spend one year as general dentist, whether in residency or internship or whatever. It just makes you a better specialist, well, especially I'm a, for perio. I'm out here in Arizona, which is considered the Florida of the West. So when you tell someone it, they have 10 cavities and gum disease, they say, I just want the bleaching. And uh, so uh, a <laughs> little, little different out here. Same with MBA school. I had a con I, had, I several times I, I told the dean of the dental school, you know, I opened up my practice in 87 and then I went back to night school in 98, 99, got my MBA. And all the people who had worked at Intel or Motorola or, or Fry's or whatever for five or 10 years, they were learning so much and taking so much. But the kids who just graduated from business school went right to MBA school. They didn't have any experience. They, you, you could tell by their questions, they didn't even, they didn't even get it. And I always said, don't, don't, why would you take a kid straight out of business school? And cause he just wants his initials behind his name. I said, let him go out and work in the real world. And then after five, 10 years, come back as a retreat. Um, so I know they're gonna ask you, um, the IDF meeting is uh, this month in Cologne and there's over 250 dental implant companies 
that have a booth there. So she's 25 years old. She's listening to you. You're a diplomat in Perio. Uh, you've done this longer than she's alive. She wants to know what system do you use? Um, I mean, I can't speak to, uh, specifically to one system, but I would say pick an implant company that is going to be around five years from now. Um, and you want a reputable company. Yeah, you're going to pay a little bit more, but the tit- the surface is better. Whether you're using Nobel, Strauman, Astra, I I was trained on Nobel. At, at, I mean, at UCSF, and it was we had to be Brandmark certified. I don't know if you remember those days. Sure, where I do. He wouldn't even teach. You scrubbed in. Yeah. You, it was like beta on on the face. The, the center got Brandmark certified in order for you to place a Nobel implant. Well, it's not like that anymore, but I urge the people that are placing implants, whether they're general dentists or specialists, use an, um, one of the top four or five because people move around. If compo- I saw somebody the other day, an implant abutment screw broke, but they're no, this person had it done in another country. Well, this it's a brand that no one's heard of. We try to look up, look it up on my website. What is this implant? Nobody can figure out. So now that implant has to come out and that is not an easy procedure. So, you know, if I could give any advice to myself or the younger dentist is to have a long term view, do the right thing. And the long term, you're going to come out ahead because the patient will know that you you did the right thing by them. Okay, the name and what what is your short list of, of dental implant companies that are profitable, will be here in 10 years, doing research. What what are what what are the ones that you can go long term with? You said Nobel, Nobel. Strauman, Nobel, Strauman, Astra, probably Bicon because they have the shorty uh, Bio Horizons. Um yeah. What, and what did you say about Bicon? Because what? They have a shorty fatty for like if you have someone who has Are you has talking about me or the implant? <laughs> no, me. See, I, I want to promote by I want to promote anything that's short and fat. So I'm going to go with the Bicon then. <laughs> so Bicon is, you know, the only thing with a Bicon, it's a, a single implant. There's no custom abutments with it. But it's just, you know, if you have a short site, but all the implant companies now make short fat implants, all of them, they, they all do. But that was the big claim for Bicon is that, it, you know, if you have a five, six millimeter, you can just place an upper without doing a sinus lift, whether it's a full sinus lift or a summer's lift. But all of them have that now. But honestly, in my mind, you know, and I probably am offending some company, I don't know, but the top three are no uh, Strauman, Nobel, Astra. Um, and they're going to be around. You know, the components are going to be around. That nothing is worse than when you have an abutment screw break and they no longer make that implant. Or the, you know, the abutment. Well, they're, uh, they're they're, sort of- so, someone posts a picture every single day on Dentaltown. Does anybody know what implant this is? I mean, yeah. I mean, I mean, there's even a website. Um, there's even a website. Yeah. What is this implant? Yeah, we what had him on the show. Um, I'm just real quick. You said treatment of mucogingival defects. There was the old classification, Miller one, two, three, and what did you say the new European classification was? RT one, two, and three. And I can uh, email that to you if you want to. No, um, I want you to post it on Dental Town. I want you to go on their uh, Perio and say, "Hey, I did a podcast." I did. I have it on my. Um, I did a, a CE course, periodontal plastic surgery, and it's in there. It's oh, in nice. my CE course. And, yes, and, it's in there. It shows the new, the old classification system compared to the new. And when and does that course it, go live? Um. I don't know. I have to ask Dr. Goldstein. They have my stuff and we'll see when they get it together. Nice. Well, thank you so much for doing that. Yeah, he hasn't released it yet. You might have to drive down to Bethlehem, Pennsylvania and wake him up or something. Maybe he's, uh, <laughs> maybe he fell, maybe, <laughs> maybe he fell asleep. But, um, so the old system was Miller one, two, three, and now the new system, um, is, uh, RT one, two, and three. And what's RT stand for? Uh, I forgot. Huh. Sorry, I forgot. So um, I want you to talk about, um, I'm just, I'm just going to throw words out there. I want you to talk about ridge aug- augmentation. Yes. So you can have ridge augmentation, you can have SAR, hard or soft tissue, or you can have a, co- a co- combination. So that classification is called the Seabird. Seabird one, two, and three. 
Seabird one, you're missing a uh, buccolingual ridge width, right? Seabird two, you're missing corona apical ridge height. Seabird three is a combination of the two, where that's also will be in my um, CE course, uh, the seabird classifications and the ridge defects, photos of what one, two, and three look like. So obviously zebra three is the most difficult to handle because you have a buccal lingual and a, a coronal apical uh, defect that you have to regenerate. So most of the time it's uh, you regenerate it with soft and hard tissue. And what we use in our office is what you talked about with Dr. Um, your the last period also you had LPRF. We use bone, LPRF, and then I'll do a connective tissue graft as well. And when you're um, using bone, what kind of bone do you like to use? Do you like to? I use mineralized. You use what? Mineralized cortical, mineralized cortical bone. And why is that? Um, it just, if you, I have found that you get a turnover faster in three to four months of viable bone to place your implant versus if you have demineralized. And I don't, I'm not a big fan of the synthetics uh, I just don't think it has the tensile strength for uh, ridge augmentation. When you go drill into it for an implant, you'll lose like half your buckle plate. That's been in my hands. Now, a lot of people like to use that in uh, sinus lifts because it adds bulk to the site and you don't have to put as much, but um, I usually just use mineralized cortical bone. And when you say Seabird one, two, and three, how do you spell Seabird? S-E-I-B-E-R-T. B-E-R-T. Okay. That'll also be in that um, CE course. That um, a lot of them are um, wondering. Um, someone comes in, and you know they're the vast middle class, the lower middle class. They have to have a molar pulled. Um, would you bone graft that or not? Some people say they would bone graft it if you were going to place an implant within a year. Some people say if they're not going to get an implant in twelve months, the bone grafting is um, is useless. What where do you weigh in on that? I weigh in on the former. I would bone graft it. And this is what I say to the patient, and people are welcoming you. I said, do you want to have an alarm on your house before it's broken into or after it's broken into? You want to have an alarm before. So putting in the bone will maintain the ridge height and width, even if you decide to do an implant or not. It maintains the ridge for the restorative doctor to place a, a proper size tonic. So in the first two years, after you take a tooth out, 60% of the buccal plate resorbs, 60%. If you don't have something there to exclude the soft tissue and maintain that bone, you're gonna have the dehiscence of the buccal plate, which is uh, very vital for the proper emergence and maintenance of an implant. So I always try to tell a patient, if at any point you're gonna consider doing the implant, you need to do a bone graft. It's just, it is so hard to recoup what has been lost versus to prevent the, lo the loss. Again, the analogy of the uh, burglar, you know, alarm. You know, it's better to have one before you're broken into than after. But, Maybe you that's know, a but what, what percent of dentists do you think in America they don't even offer to bone graft and extraction? I yeah, mean, they I, don't even, I, I mean, every time I go to McDonald's, which is only two or three times a day, and I order a cheeseburger, they, the 16 year old kid says, do you want fries with that? I say, yes. Yeah. Then they say, you want a chocolate mold? I say, yes. And I always wonder why they quit asking. I would have gone, I would have kept going, cookies, ice cream, whatever. But they, they pull a tooth and a 16 year old kid would say, would you like bone grafting with that afterwards? And what percent of dentists in America you think don't even ask? I think a lot, I think you're right. That is the key, if you're a young person starting out, Learn how to do bone grafting. You got to take the tooth out. You got to get every morsel of granulation tissue out. You got to get down to bleeding bone and pack bone. If you want to use a membrane, collar tape, collar coat, learn how to take teeth out atraumatically without taking out the entire buccal plate and graft. Uh, I, I mean, it, the patients will appreciate it. And, you know, the bone grafting materials is not that expensive it, it, you can buy a jar you know i don't know for like two three hundred and you can split it up you don't have to use it all on one patient you just pour out some of the dappin dish and 
uh, hydrate it with sterile water and, and pack that. And there are bone syringes you can buy, you can use an amalgam carrier, and just basically condense. But the key to bone grafting is to get every piece of granulation tissue out of the socket. Otherwise, remember this, soft tissue grows at a rate of a half a millimeter a day. So epithelium grows at a half a millimeter a day. Bone takes months, right? So if you leave soft tissue, it'll proliferate, proliferate, proliferate at a half a millimeter a day. You know, in 10 days, you have five millimeters of soft tissue. So you gotta get all the granulation tissue out, get down to bleeding bone, pack the bone not too tight, close it over. I use crisscross sutures a lot of times if I don't use a membrane. And you don't have to use a membrane all the time. You just wanna maintain that buckle plate. And also it comes down to surgical skill. You do not wanna wipe off the buckle plate and expect it to regenerate, right? I, 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 the teeth. There, there's another, um, I, I know of this feud going on within group practices. I, I know this existing feud several times. Some, some uh, dentists and periodontists and oral surgeons will not do the bone grafting or place the implant if you're smoking. And the other people say, well, I mean, 15, I mean, who needs all the implants? It's usually not your yoga instructor. You know, uh, it's usually the guy, you know, going on your beer runs. Um, so so how do you, I mean, I mean, there really is a huge difference uh, in uh, different areas, but what is your criteria? I want to get, I want to replace this tooth with an implant. I smoke a pack a day. What, what, what do you, where do you draw the line? So um, I would actually have a different exclusion criteria. If you're an uncontrolled diabetic, and if you have a collusal trauma, I mean, you can't just do an isolated thing. If someone smoked, that to me is not necessarily an exclusion. I have seen uh, smokers that have had successful implants. If their occlusion is stable, if their oral hygiene is good, if they are coming back from maintenance, they get a mouth guard, that's not an automatic exclusion. I, I think in the olden days, it, that used to be. Um, I just find that that's pretty limiting. You can't just write off a whole group of people because they smoke. I mean, people smoke, but they still have coronary disease and they still get stents and then they still smoke. Should the cardiologist say, sorry, you smoke, I'm not putting in a stent, and what, right? And what I do, I always try to motivate them to switch from Marlboro to Marlboro Light. Uh, I think that uh, that uh, might, uh, <laughs> yeah. might help. My it, dad was a really heavy smoker and he was a periodontist and I'd be like, look, why are you doing this? And he'd say, I love it. You know, I, I mean, he died when he was in his like early eighties, but he loved it. He loved to smoke. And I would say, and he smoked, what's that really bad? The camel. That was his smoking thing. So, um, and he was a periodontist, but I mean, people are people. You can't just automatically write them off. You have to try to motivate. And you may be that one person that says, Hey, you know what? I really, can I get you to smoke less than that? Because after, if you smoke less than that, it, I'll have a greater success. And I'm amazed that many people will. Now, one thing I want to tell you about smoking and smoking cessation. When you stop smoking, a year after you stop, people's gums start to bleed more. You know why, right? Because all the immune factors are coming back into the uh, site and you are actually like somebody who's had fibrotic tissue probing twos and threes and fours, all of a sudden they're probing six, sevens and eights, but that's a true reflection of their paranormal status, not what they had before. Yeah, and it's amazing. I don't, um, we've lost all the gains of the, uh, the, the kids in high 21 and under, the, the smoking had been going down, 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 down. Then vaping came out. Vaping is so and, bad. And we lost all our gains. Um, so what would you tell a patient who says vaping is more healthy than smoking? No, oh, I had that. I had that last week. A guy who I did uh, laser surgery on and highly educated person. He's in the medical field. He said he started vaping because he went to Greece and he picked it up there. Um, and I said, you know, you've got formaldehyde in your mouth. Do you realize that? And he's like, well, it's not nicotine. And I said, it's worse, it's formaldehyde. Uh, and a lot of those are uh, based with uh, sugar. So they'll get a lot of cervical caries. You'll see people with cervical decay that, that vape. Um, I don't know how that's allowed, but hey, 
you know, you try to encourage people again. And, and with him, he said, well, I have to do something. I gave up smoking. So I said, well, can you like chew gum? Can you chew on a pencil? You know, do something other than uh, vaping because that's equally as bad as, if not worse. We don't know the long-term effects. We yeah. know that smoking causes immune system deficiency, lazy neutrophils, um, that host, res host uh, response is diminished. So there's all these factors, and I think it's the same with vaping. So um, one thing that concerns me is like, um, like when you had bonding agents came out and you had, you know, the bottle of A and B and it was just an amazing bonding system. Like, like take Bisco's bonding agent. I mean, just great bonding agent. But you know, the dentist, they didn't want a two step and they, they wanted a one step. And so they kept going to the next generation bonding agent and all that. And, and, and I always sat there and thought, you know, you're a doctor. If I was getting a bypass, I wouldn't want some guy to say, well, you know, the great way to do a bypass takes two steps and, I just want to do one step. It's like, just do the right thing. I'm starting to see that or wonder about that with implants, doing it in uh, immediate loading implants versus burying the implant and let it heal for a couple of months. I mean, at, at, what, do you, what do you think about the difference between immediate load or staged implants? So I'm old. So <laughs> I'll tell you, I've learned from my experiences uh, it is rare, rare that I do an immediate molar. I've never done an immediate molar, and I just don't think you need to push the envelope that hard. I will do immediate implants, but I will not load them. One, I've been burned, and I can tell you so many stories. Uh, one time, I did an immediate implant with immediate provisional. It was beautiful. But the patient decided, I have a tooth. I am not going on to step two, which is an abutment and a crown. So she left and never came back and had the implant restored. Lesson one. Lesson two, if you immediately load the implant, you're putting, everybody talks about getting the emergence profile for the soft tissue by immediately provisionalizing, right? That way you can get the papillas to fill in. Well, you can do that by the proper location of the implant. And we can talk about that. You can t that has to do with using guided surgery not putting the implant too close to the adjacent teeth, not putting it too deep, putting it in the center of the ridge. If you have to air, air on the palatal side. But the emergence profile of the abutment and the crown has to do with the location of the implant. And if it's placed correctly, whether with a guide or without, you're gonna, you can almost, you, you really want to start at the end. And, and I, all the restorative doctors that I work with, I tell them the implant is a restorative driven decision. It is not something I'm going to throw an implant there and then send the patient back to them. I need to start with them, get, you know, work it up with them to begin with. And then we work our way back. So we know what we're going to, how we will end before we even start. Um, there are, and so, there are some periodontists who believe that the cause of uh, periimplantitis is mainly that when it was surgically placed, there was not a connected tissue all the way around the implant. And that if you did the implant and and you had attached gingiva all the way around it, um, you wouldn't be seeing all this periimplantitis. What what do you think of that? Um, I mean, I'm sure you've heard that in a lecture before. Do you believe yeah, it yeah. or not believe it? So um, that's also in the CE course that I'm gonna do. It's talking about, do you need attached gingiva around implants? That's one of the topics that I cover in that CE course. I don't think that's necessarily the cause for all periimplantitis, but I do think you need a band of attached gingiva. If you do not, it is difficult for the patient to maintain it clean, and then you'll get biofilm buildup, and then you'll get uh, bone loss, some threads exposed. So I saw somebody the other day that had an implant done in 2016, and they developed a dehiscence on the facial of the implant, so I did a connective tissue graft on the facial to cover up the threads. And I tunneled it from the mucogingival junction down because you can't lift the papillas or else they're gonna have even more threads exposed. So there is some truth to that, but um, it's not the end all be all for why all implants fail or the implants that do fail. It has to do, I think it's a combination. I think if anything I could stress you know, you got to look at everything. You got to look at the surrounding teeth. You got to look at the position of the implant. You got to look at occlusion. You have to look, is it cement retained, screw retained, uh, the, the profile of the abutment that's chosen. 
And that's one thing I, you know, I, as long as I've been a dentist, I recently learned in the last three years about the restorative doctor choosing the correct abutment for the situation. It makes a huge difference to the final crown and aesthetics and then cleansability for the patient. Nice. Um, and I also want to tell the kids over and over and over, when you when you were talking about the emergence profile, remember, um, a beautiful woman with um, who loves her teeth um, cares about that about 8,000 times more than grandpa with a liver spot on his forehead. I mean, you know, when, when you're getting into implants, the first hundred need to all be in short, fat, bald guys in the posterior, first molar, upper second by because I see so many kids and they're looking at this missing anterior tooth and they think well that's easy access I can see it just leaning back in my lap and and my god just just stay away from anyone gorgeous and stay away from front teeth for at least a hundred implants would you agree or disagree with that I absolutely that that is the most difficult restoration the anterior single crown you know oh, yeah. especially even the more difficult is the lower Again, you know, that comes from just experience. You know, if you do a lower incisor crown, those are the most difficult because it has to look right from the top, this way and that way. So an anterior implant, I, you know, like you said, I wouldn't even try it without having placed at least 100 implants. And even that, um, a lot of the patients, you gotta look at their smile line, you look at the biotype of the tissue, is it thin, thick, is there a freedom pull? What is the contact like of the adjacent teeth? If you, if your implant's high, your contact's going to be too low, so you're going to have black triangles. I mean, it's there are so many things that go into doing an aesthetic implant besides uh, an immediate provisional. It's it really it takes a lot of planning and a lot of uh, experience. Like you said, maybe start off with, um, you know, number 19, number 30, number 20, 29. Um, those are all slam dunks, right? You know, hopefully, um, if you follow all the protocol. Do you see a bigger cosmetic market among women than you do men? Is that a, is that a fair assessment or, or am I just being showing my old school? No, I think you're right, but it also depends where you are. Like in LA, I bet it's equal, right? You know, there's, yeah. uh, yeah, and here in, in North Carolina, yeah, more women, are concerned with the aesthetics than they are. One, one thing uh, that I see where women just, they, they just don't accept it is the gummy smile. Um, what, what, what do you, you know, do, do you think that's more an orthodontic surgery solution? Do you think that's a periodontal surgery solution? What would, would you tell someone they need to see an orthodontist and an oral surgeon or a periodontist for a gummy smile? That's an excellent question. So that's a multifaceted problem. It could be as short as altered uh, passive eruption or altered active eruption. If, or they could have, so if they have, so as a period honest, it's, it's going to be rare for me to just cut the gum away and um, not address the bone. So if somebody, let's say, has a gummy smile and you're measuring the incisal at length or shorter, you want to uh, diagnose the correct problem. Is it altered passive, altered active? And you you might get a stent from the restorative doctor, although uh, in the years that I practiced, I've never had. I've, I've always just kind of freehanded it, it's, and it's usually after ortho. You do a full thickness flap, scallop, and then you got to find the CJ and see if it's covered with bone. If it's covered with bone, you got to take away that bone two millimeters below the CJ, and then festoon like you would a denture and then close it, close it up. Okay, well for- Those, by the way, are the most gratifying surgeries because the patients, you sit them up and you give them a mirror and they're, they're usually crying because they can't articulate why they don't like their teeth until you do that and they're like, oh my God, I have teeth. My teeth are whiter and brighter because it, the gumminess will put, cast shadow on their teeth. Yeah, it, it, it's a big self-esteem deal with women. I, I I admit that it's a big deal. But you're using some terms that might be over the heads of some of these uh, kids when they're still in school. Um, ex go back and explain altered active and versus uh, passive eruption. So when a tooth erupts through the, you know, it comes through the alveolus, it usually comes through all the way with a CJ and then the uh, soft tissue recedes back, right? So that's 
you're you're going to have a natural option. The CEJ is above the bone by two millimeters, let's say on our upper, and then the soft tissue will form a collar there. So with altered active eruption, the tooth erupts, but it does not erupt through the osseous crest. It, it, the CJ is at the osseous crest and the soft tissue is on enamel. <clears throat> but altered passive eruption, it, it erupts through the uh, bone, the CJ is above the bone, but the soft tissue is above it. So you can do a gingivectomy there, but most of us will go in and kind of fine tune the bone Festoon it a little, give like that root eminence. You know how we did that indenture setup? We did the festooning where you give the eminence of the root between the teeth. Uh, and that way you get the tissue to lay softer. Also, I think um, Dr. Farron and I put that in my CE course that's coming up. Nice. So I covered a lot of the aesthetic aesthetic perio things, yes. So I'll read the uh, I'll read a, a definition. Active eruption is defined as tooth movement in the occlusal direction as a tooth erupts from its osseous crypt. Altered active eruption, AAE, occurs when teeth achieve the opposite relationship to the occlusal plane prematurely and the osseous cyst is on or very close to the cemento enamel junction. Do you like that or not really? I do like it. Okay. Um, I want to ask you something. Um, I don't know if I'm uh, drinking with the wrong dentist or, you know, maybe... Uh, or maybe uh, Arizona Cardinals fans are, are not as uh, sharp as the New England Patriot fans in your backyard. But it seems like every- what? No, we no, not New England, no, no, no. No, we're- um, Oh, you're North Carolina. No, wait. You're North Carolina. We're in Panthers, hello, we're the Panthers. <laughs> oh my gosh, I at that Super Bowl, uh, I, uh, I felt so sorry for you guys because when you guys played uh, the Denver Broncos, I would have bet my house that that young quarterback yeah. that can do a flip over the line and land on his feet lost to an old decrepit man who had neck problems and you know was fired from the Colts and how did that old grandpa cowboy uh, Manning um, beat uh, your quarterback in this in the Super Bowl? That was just uh, called cheating. Deflating the balls. <laughs> I think he cheated. So uh, I don't know. But um, but but when I talk to my periodontist friends, they tell me that they have five, just like maybe only five or six dentists that refer almost a hundred percent of their crown lengthening, and then the other twenty-five dentists have never sent one. Do do you see that? I mean, is it the eighty twenty rule? Why do why do twenty percent of all the dentists in the United States do eighty percent of the crown lengthenings? And why are there? There's dentists out there that are listening to you right now that have practiced ten years and have never done never done it one time. And they go, oh, they're all fine. So, do you agree with that huge uh, diversion? Yeah, I do. I definitely see that, and it is amazing because you do see some that recognize it. Again, it's that short-term reward. It, yes, it's easier to put a crown on it and do a post and violate the biological width. And, and by the way, not every patient will have a biological width violation and not in every part of the mouth. So for example, you can see somebody where they'll have a biological width violation on number 30, but number 13 also has a crown that goes subgenital will not be. So it, it's case by case. In, in the long run, the patient's better off having had crown lengthening, and so will the restorative diet. Their impression will be easier, seating the crown will be easier, there will, potentially won't be any cement sub-G, um, but it is true. I don't know why um, certain doctors are more comfortable with that, where others will pull out a laser or a cautery and just cauterize the tissue that's bleeding. But I know if it was me, I would want everything done, you know, step by step. So this, you're, is, you're right. this is dentistry uncensored and it's my job to get you in trouble. And so I'm gonna start um, asking you some uh, controversial questions to get you in trouble. Um, these young kids get out of school, they go work for a big DSO and a non-dentist, non-clinical person says that every single pocket over six millimeters deep needs to have a rust in uh, because there's an insurance cold and, and sometimes they feel bad because they're placing like a rust in, in 10 different sites on some lady and they don't even believe in it. So my question to you is, um, a rust in, do you think do you think you should be placing a rustin in these deep pockets 
uh, especially since they're incentivized uh, to believe it because there's an insurance code. I mean, if you're doing it in conjunction with scaling and replaning and you do it once and they come back for their maintenance in three months and there hasn't been a change, it is time to refer that person out to a specialist. You know, I understand, you know, I understand it's a business, I understand the business model, but in the long run, if they try it, they try to scan and replay, and it may work here and there. And arresting, you know, the subjectivity, the longevity of it is 90 days. So if they do scaling and replaying and put arrested, if you're just sticking arrested without doing scaling and replaying or anesthetizing the area, I really don't think that's going to be beneficial. But you may uh, limit the amount of work that the periodontist needs to do or the amount of sites that the periodontist needs. But if you do it time after time after time, I'm not really sure that's in the patient's best interest. And I hear that a lot. It's like, oh, it's so hard to get the to patients to go to the periodontist. No one wants to go to the periodontist, right? Everyone would rather see the endodontist or oral surgeon or whatever, because the perception is that periosurgery is so painful, right? But now we have modalities that make it not painful. So it's, it's you know, especially if the periodontist you're using is up on the latest and greatest technology, it's not a painful procedure. It can be a non-event like that patient told me today. It was one Tylenol surgery where it's not going to be as painful. Can I ask you a couple more overtime questions? Yeah, sure. sure. Um, she's confused. She's 25. She's looking at this. Um, it, it's got furcation involvement. When, when, when do you treat furcation involvement? And when do you, um, when do you treat it with extraction and titanium? And when do you treat it? Um, furcation. And is it fair to say um, a lower furcation on a molar is much easier than upper furcation on a maxer? So j just talk about furcations to help her with her diagnosis and treatment planning. So I would treat it as early as possible. So in a class one furcation, treat it. We look for, as, uh, as periodontists, we look for enamel pearls in the furcation, which is a projection of the enamel into the furcation that would cause attachment loss. Foreign body, bone loss, you always want to rule out endo, always, always, because, or a root fracture, because a lot of times, if the tooth is heavily restored, you'll have a, a fracture in the floor of the chamber, and that'll show up as uh, bone loss in the furcation. You're not going to get the classic, you know, widened PDL, but you'll get a, a horizontal bone loss in the furcation. The upper furcations are really difficult to treat. Um, so, you know, in, in when I was in grad school, we would lay a flap, let's say on number three, you would uh, put a membrane on the facial and wrap it around to the mesial, bone graft it first after you uh, opened it up, cleaned it out with a cavitron, looked for enamel pearls, looked for any, you know, debris, then you pack bone and then you put a membrane. We would use Guidor or Gore-Tex. Now, uh, no one's, you know, doing that. I would treat it now with my laser and I treat it sooner than, than later. Uh, it's just uh, the sooner you can treat it, the better. I don't know that a furcation involvement condemns a tooth to an extraction. I, I'm just not, you know, I'm not there. Um, maybe other people are, but I'm not there. I would do everything possible to save my molar if I had a furcation involvement. Yeah, I agree. You know, there's so much social media out there saying all these things about electric toothbrushes um, versus manual brushing. You're you're a periodontist. When when someone's when someone really needs to be on top of their plaque removal and all that stuff, what are your thoughts on electric versus brush, uh, mouthwash, chlorhexidines, iodines? Some people um, on Dental Town, you know. So what are your what are your thoughts there? Do you, do you think there's a big advantage of buying an expensive electric versus a manual toothbrush? I do think it's, a, uh, it's a, an advantage. I always recommend the Sonicare toothbrush because the Sonicare wave breaks up the plaque about three to four millimeters beyond the reach of the brush. And they're not that expensive. You could get them at Costco or Sam's Club. You can get two for $99. I mean, they have all generations. They have ones that you can charge to your laptop. There are some, I, I have one from five years ago that dispenses toothpaste. It had a, a cartridge that you place Crest toothpaste and you dispense a piece size. But I do think the Sonicare is better. Um, I don't like a lot of the crazy dentrifices that people are using, like charcoal. Um, you know, I think that's crazy. People uh, need to stick with 
Um, toothpaste, not a whole lot. If you have sensitive teeth, use Prevident just at night. I live on a well, I live in the country. I use Prevident myself at night. Um, and I don't believe in, in having somebody endlessly on PerioGuard or Chlorhexidine. It does stain, it, it stains your teeth. So during this, after surgery, for example, when I do even a soft tissue graft, we put them on it for a week and then when they come back, I have them switch to just brushing it on with a very soft surgery brush that we give them because it does stain your teeth. Uh, and as you said, most Americans are very, um, uh, you know, they're not into having dark stained teeth. They want white, bright teeth. You, you recommend Sonicare Electric Toothbrush. Um, do you also recommend a water pick or not really? Yes, water picks are great for those that can't floss. Absolutely. You just want to break up the plaque front. You want to not, not remember the corn cob theory of plaque when we learned in school so long ago? The longer the plaque gets, the more virulent it becomes. So you just want to break up the plaque so it doesn't get more virulent. Okay. Um, and then I'm just going to throw it out there pinhole technique. So I know of the pinhole technique. I do not do it and I have not taken the course, but I know several people that do. For us, many of us that have been around, it's really a coronally reposition flap um, where you just hike the tissue down. If you have a nice zone of attached gingiva, it works beautifully. If you do not have a nice zone of attached gingiva, uh, fundamentally, I don't know how that can last, but I'm not knocking it. I don't have any knowledge of it. I am not taking it, and I know a lot of people do. And, uh, you know, for our patients to hear that you don't have to violate their palate, but again, the palate incision for a connective tissue graft is nothing like a free gingival graft. It's a linear incision, it doesn't hurt. It's You get primary closure, so it usually heals up within one or two days. You know, when I got out of school, those electric toothbrushes were free. <laughs> they were actually free, but now they got all those security cameras at all those stores that now you have to uh, now you have to pay for them. I, uh, but hey, seriously, um, I can't believe at the end of a long, busy day that you decided to log on and talk to my homies for over an hour and build us an online CE course. Um, I just, uh, I'm so indebted to you. I'm so honored. Thank you oh, so no. much. Thank you. At the end Thank of a you long so day. Much. And my, my only advice to you is I can't believe you left Germany and San Francisco to go to North Carolina. You might reconsider <laughs> that decision. Um, I, I still think San Francisco and um, and Vancouver, British Columbia, that's the two greatest cities in the United States. But uh, your uh, North Carolina is beautiful. Those were four seasons. So thank you, Hannah, so much for coming thank on the so show. Thank you so much. I, I really appreciate it. I enjoyed it so much. Thank you so much. All right. You have a great day.